You do. What are you left with? What is the thing that is persistent? Right? The code is not even there yet. Okay? So that's one problem. The one problem is we need artifacts to represent mental models. Okay? Now, of course, you can say, well, I can write another program to represent this program. Of course, you can do that. Okay? But how useful is it? Okay, so that's the first point. The first point is when before we write code, before we write code, all of us have written code, we have mental models. But we are in such a tearing hurry and we're so enthused about writing code, we just go start typing on the keyboard, we open a buffer, something.python, we start hammering code or Java, whatever it is, right? Of course, there are tools today that give you UML and these are what tools that UML are supposed to, they're supposed to slow you down actually. Start writing code in the UML, you've got to go through the hoops of UML, you know, class diagrams, this diagrams. But what are they doing? They're giving you representations of the mental model that you need to understand the code. Right? Everyone here has used UML in some form or heard of it? Yeah. So the primary purpose of UML is to explicate your design, including requirements. I mean, requirements are just going to club up them together, right? So the explication, the Making things explicit, the knowledge you have, right, is very, very essential. Now, most of us, when we write programs, we don't do this. We don't do it. Okay? We just write code, we write. So, what do we do to, to explicate our knowledge about the model that we're working with? We write comments. We say, okay, here's a so. Notice the comments are post factor. The comments are after the code is written. Right? Now, it's a very interesting transformation that happens because your mental model itself undergoes a transformation once you write the code. Because once you write the code, what you start commenting is about the code, not so much your mental model. The mental model is somehow a bus ran over it. Is it there? Okay? That's a shame. I think that is the real intellectual property of any organization. That understanding. That understanding is the it's slightly diffuse, that understanding is diffuse. The code is sort of a crystallization of that understanding. Okay? But the problem is the code also comes with something else, which is very interesting. It's trying to crystallize understanding, but also brings in a lot of non-comprehension. It becomes hard to divine out of that code the understanding that went into the mental model you built up. You understand what I'm saying, right? To reverse engineer from the piece of code, the mental model and whatever was going on, it's very hard. Okay. I, I, I mean, all of you not only have written code, you've also read code. Okay. Now let me tell you that's the world's worst torture. Reading code is torture. I mean, honestly, I, let me admit to you after almost 40 years of programming. Okay. I can't read code. I honestly can't. I tell my class, my students. I tell you, don't ever get me to read your code. I can't read it. I mean, honestly, it requires tremendous effort for me to read code. Because what am I trying to do when I read code? Tell me. Why, why would you want to read code? Okay, this is an important question to ask. Why would you be in a situation where you have to read code? Sorry? Speak a little louder so that I can hear you. Right. Somebody has done something. Somebody had an idea. And that idea got crystallized into a piece of code. The crystallization is a lossy transformation. Okay. So what you're trying to do is there was something that existed that dissipated, right? Because you got this trans it got transformed to code, but something else dissipated. So you're going to try to create that. Right? And that requires energy. Right? It's almost like a thermodynamic property if you think about it. Right? It's really that. Something's dissipated, and now you're trying to actually bring it back. So that requires a lot of effort. It can be done, but it requires tremendous effort. Of course, not only that, it's, it's prone to mistakes. You could have got something wrong, and then you know it just gets worse and worse. So reading code is very hard if you don't have means. So now let me tell you. I mean, the, the two problems I pointed out is one is when you write code, you need a mental model. Second is when you read code, you need a mental model. You at least need a mental model of somebody else. Okay. And uh, so it's important to be able to represent mental models. So now this is the, the most important idea of 
about latent programming is, you know what? This is the wrong way to think. This whole thing that I told you about, this is the wrong way to program. This is not programming. Programming is not about writing a program. Okay? Programming is not about writing a program. Okay, then what is it about? Sorry? Okay. I would claim that solving the problem is a side effect. Right, so I, I'll put that in a slightly uh, kind of a slightly different way. I think the most important, I most important thing all of us have is we have to be able to tell a story. We have to be able to narrate. Okay? We need to create narratives, not programs. Okay, I'm not some, I'm not an artist. I don't, you know, artists do narratives about things. But a narrative is the most important idea. What is a narrative? A narrative could be a blog, a narrative could be a story, a narrative could be a comment, could be any of these things. Right? It's a story. Okay? You have to be able to tell a story. You have to be able to say, why is this what I'm doing important? What is interesting about it? And oh, by the way, here's a nice picture, here's a nice diagram, here's a nice equation that describes what I'm doing. And separate, just like you have tables and pictures and videos and things like that, you also have an artifact or a program that supports the narrative. Okay? So please understand what I'm saying. What I'm trying to say might sound very radical to you. What I'm saying is you don't write comments to support a program, you write a program to support a narrative. The privacy of the narrative is what you need to believe in, not the privacy of your code. Okay. When you decide and make that shift in your mind, that wait a minute, I'm not writing a program. It's like saying, you know, you pick up a book, there's a book somewhere I, I saw here, right? Okay. Yeah, is it correct to say that this book is about the pictures? It's not about it, it has pictures, but it's not about the pictures. Right? Pictures are supporting a narrative. Tables are supporting a narrative. The chapters are supporting a structure of the narrative. But they are not the narrative. Similarly, the program is not the narrative. The program is supporting a narrative. Right? I mean, suppose I just take some random examples of sorting. And I explain what sorting is. Okay, I explain the sorting about permutations. I say, well, you know, now I'm going to start thinking how to sort. Maybe I can swap things. You're telling a story of how your program will be, but it's not really about your program. It's about how you are thinking about solving that problem. You're expressing your intent to solve the problem. You're expressing a requirement how to solve the problem, and you're also expressing your design. And by the way, you're also going to express when this program runs, test cases, logging conditions, and then you're going to write. Imagine you're writing some complicated code to solve some complicated differential equation, just let's say for our purposes. Okay. But I want to see the differential equations. I don't want to see the code. Okay. I want to see a plot of how this differential equations solution behaves under these boundary conditions. I want to see that. I want the reader to see that. I want to see it myself. I want to be able to experience this idea. Look, this is what I want to solve. Right? So this is the most important idea I learned about programming after programming for many decades. I learned that programming is not about programs. No, no, no. Okay. So great questions. Why is they you know we just say algorithm? What is algorithm? Suppose I just I mean how different is algorithm you write in pseudocode? But how do I put a picture of the algorithm and what it does? Maybe the algorithm doing some image transformations. Right? Can I show with an image you know what it's doing? No, I actually want to see the image right there. Right? I have to build a narrative. This is an image processing algorithm that's doing some blurring or something. How do I know what blurring is? How do I know the next programmer is going to take your seat? Knows what blurring is? You want to show a picture. So please understand you want to build rich narratives. Rich narratives. 
Okay, what is a rich narrative? A rich narrative has everything. It has text, it has diagrams, it has graphics, it has videos maybe, it has even good talking, it has even a chat of all history of all the discussion about that. But imagine you're actually looking at this piece of code and you're interested in, um, I don't know, code hermeneutics, I suppose. You're looking at this code and you say, who else looked at this code? I mean, first of all, how old is code? Oh, it's only 20 years old, no problem. Okay. In 20 years, and by the way, it's not uncommon to see 20 year old code. Huh? So, okay, who, what, how many pairs of eyes looked at this code in 20 years? And what did they do after looking at it? Did they record what they did? Where is the record of your predecessor looking at the piece of code and recording information? Is it there? How many of you have found your predecessor's footprints of that code? How many of you have maintained code even for one day? None of you? You all written new code? All of you? Wow, you are very lucky. Huh? Okay, so what did you see? You see the piece of code, what do you see after that? Okay, you see comments and? Okay, now these days of course you have hit, uh, you know, comment messages and so on. So what do you see those comment messages? You have to open the comment message, right? So you're looking at the code, another window is open, the GitHub comment messages and say, okay, well, you made this change. So you're not going to change. How many comment messages actually talk about the model? Very few. Because if the purpose of a comment message is to tell you and give you the reason for the delta. That's actually building the story incrementally in a kind of a disjoint manner. It's what we have at best today. So remember, when we write code, we should be writing code. We should be writing code. We should never be told, oh, I'm making this diagram. No, no, no. You're going to be making this diagram because you have a bigger story to tell. Imagine a comic book. A comic book is telling a story. It's got lots of diagrams. But the diagram, if I take out the dialogues, you know, what will it be? Similarly, if I change the you know, dialogues, I just keep the dialogue, you know, the comic, the experience is lost. That experience is what I, when I'm reading the story, I'm building a mental model of this mystery or whatever this story is. That is very important. And you have to capture that. So all of us have to become storytellers. And literate programming is that opportunity for you to become a storyteller. Okay, the rest of the talk you can leave if you want. So this is the most important message. The rest of it is details. Okay, how to do this? What tools do you have? Does it work in this case? What can I do with it? Blah blah blah. Okay, but this is it. Okay, so I'm going to give you three or four examples. Okay, of how I can use different programming. What we talked about the first bullet, code comprehension. Okay, code comprehension means can I read the code? And what do I have? What crutches do I have when I read the code? I just explain that. Okay. I, so the rest of them are actually use cases that I've used. So these are not just made up. And second one is literate DevOps. So how many of you here do DevOps? A couple of you do DevOps. Okay. So what do you do when you do DevOps? So DevOps is very interesting because suddenly you have to think about systems, it's not about code. It's no longer about code. So what is DevOps? You're developing and deploying and maintaining and commissioning all these things. So suddenly it's a systems problem. And notice that the challenge in DevOps is everything affects everything. Source code will affect the deployment, the deployment requirement will affect the source code, all these connections and it's a very tangled mess in some sense. But it's a very complex problem and people have realized that look, I can no longer have the developer sit in one room and then the you know the tester sit somewhere else and the deployment guy sit somewhere in, the, in America or something. That's not going to work. People have to be jack of all trades at some level. And that's a very important idea. You know, literate DevOps to me is very important because and I'm giving you the example of um, let's say you have to configure some servers on the cloud. I mean, this is a true story. And you want to configure something on the cloud, and you're building this cluster on wherever Google Cloud or you know Microsoft Cloud or whatever. So you have to build this. You have to build this cluster first. Cluster exists in your mind, okay? but how it's a complicated cluster? It's got many machines. It's got a sub several subnets, and you've got to do all of this, and then you have to write uh, you know the reverse proxy, and you have to write the firewalls for these, and how they're connected, and of course each one of them becomes what code. I'm going to write the IP tables rules. I'm going to write the, you know, the 
DHCP, uh, some configuration. I need configurations, configurations of code. It's not even configurations of code, right? Configurations are data that is read by other programs, so for all practical purposes, they are programs, right? Now, suppose I write all of these things, okay? And I write all of these uh, literate DevOps, right? Let's just do this. Okay, I'll skip this example, I'll come to it at the very end. Uh, sorry for jumping like that. I'll just do this. Now, this is a problem I've had in my organization. I've worked with lots of systems administration people, I've also worked with lots of developers. And up until recently, I don't know how relevant this is right now. I suppose it is relevant to some extent that programmers don't do sysadmin or network admin. And sysadmin and network admin people rarely do program. I mean, they, they become sysadmin, so they say, why, why should I program? I mean, they can write make files and they can write shell scripts, but foundations of programming are not there. I don't know how true that is today. It is reasonable, I would assume it's true to a reasonable extent. If it's not, please raise your hand because I really want to talk to you about that. Okay? Yeah. Okay. So, so what is systems administration? You're also talking about software, you're talking about code. Okay? But then you run into the same problem, right? It's not really code, it's a character. What is that cluster? Where is the network diagram of that cluster? What are the connections? What are the constraints? What are the policies that decided this cluster is going to be run? Where are all those documented? Somebody has told us that. It's in the requirements document. Where is the requirements document? On a different server, in a different repository. How do I connect these two? How do I connect my code with the requirements? How do you do it today? The requirements are sitting in something dot doc. I don't know it's doc or HTML or whatever. And then this is sitting in some other document. Something dot py. So how do you connect the something dot dot to something dot py? Well, today you have GitHub, so you can put all of them together in nice. Repository and you know, as a, yeah, you can try all those things, right? But fundamentally, you have this problem because you want traceability. You want traceability. You want to be able to trace your requirement to the design, to the implementation, to the testing, to the deployment. Right? That's what DevOps is about. You have to have the traceability. If you don't have the traceability, you can't do it. Okay. So of course, this is more and more less and less true anymore. I mean, this is I put this up because. I know that many of you still have, many of us still have this problem. By the way, this is still a problem, believe it or not. Okay. So, um, the bad way of doing things is to, what do you do? If you're if you a sysadmin, what do you do? The bad way of doing things is SSH root. You're sitting somewhere on your beach application and you do SSH root. Okay, and then you try to log in and then you do something. Oh, let me just change that configuration, one little thing. Uh, save it and just exit and then come back and then suddenly you get a phone call saying hey you just broke the whole network and all the entire airlines collapsed. You know? So that's a bad way of doing it because you're just working with one copy of course all this people are getting better and better now so you put your sources somewhere else and the configurations are actually on your, some your local git server and then somehow you have a way to put this. I hope that's how things work here. I'm pretty convinced that they should be this way. It can't be any other way. Okay, you've got to never, ever, ever log in as root and be at a terminal. Never. Never do that. It's too risky. Okay. Uh, then how do we document that server? How do we document that network? Oh, somebody will say, okay, put this on a wiki, open GitHub, put some documentation, the wiki.md will have all that stuff, right? So we kind of we all are trying to build these narratives, but they're all kind of ad hoc. They're not they're not sticking together, they're not glued together nicely. That's the kind. Yeah, I mean, it's not that we don't know about that. We do do it unconsciously and implicitly. Okay. Okay. So this is what happens. I mean, this is the real problem we had. We had this one situation where too much of the knowledge was on in the sysadmin's head, and some of it was wrong. And as a result, it got hacked. Okay. Uh, and that is because the design was in their heads. It was not explicit. Yeah, I said, okay, where's the network diagram? Show me the subnet diagram. He said, no, we don't have the subnet diagram. It's in our heads. Okay, it's in our heads, it's on the machine. It's in the cluster, but it's nowhere else. That's a serious problem, right? So, things like this. These are real, practical, nuts and bolts issues that I'm sure all of you will be facing. How do you solve that problem? Okay, so this is what we do. 
you first of all make sure everybody learns it. You'll be surprised how many, how many people still don't know how to use it. I'm talking about not just programmers, but other people. Okay, we use the domain specific language for configuration, I'm sure, but we do this thing called little programming. And we require that the requirements be part of the narrative. You have to have what are, how should this network look like? How, where is network data, and so on and so forth. Okay? So I want to show you an example. Yeah, I think I do have an example. Let me show you that example. Let's go to opens. Right, so this is a narrative of, sorry, you don't, you don't have to read it. It's just telling you what this narrative looks like. It's a narrative about the cluster that we are configuring somewhere. It doesn't start with code. It's like a regular document, it's like an HTML document. Okay? And what is there is you go down this document, it's a pretty large document. Somewhere there is a diagram in the document. And there's a table. There is a code structure, repository structure, and you can see some code over here. What the code is is irrelevant, but notice the code is supporting the narrative. Just like the diagram is supporting the narrative, just like the table is supporting the narrative, just like the text is supporting the narrative. Okay? It's very easy to line, write one line. Input accept, forward accept, output accept, uh, accept, whatever it is. You just write something. Okay? But why are you writing it? Okay? So there is a justification of why this rule is there. Okay, rule for rate limiting new connections. This rule limits all new connections except UDP connections. It will say a proper high value, the secure system, blah, 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 blah. But that is an explanation for why the next three lines of code make sense. Okay? So that's the way we ought to be doing software. Okay? We need to be doing software that way. Okay, so let me go back to this slide. Okay, so that was my second story. Now I'll go to the third story. The first story was about generally writing code and comprehension and so on. Second one was a use case that uh, is there in our lab. I have a lab in Kiplaki and a software engineering lab. That's what we do. The third case is when I teach. I, I, I teach programming, I teach principles of programming languages, I teach mathematical theory of computing, I teach all these subjects. And I'm writing code. I'm also writing uh, mathematical equations. I'm also writing descriptions. And that's my day job. My day job is to teach. So what does that got to do with programming? You might ask, well, what is programming? Putting together ideas. Right? Uh, put together code is just part of those ideas. It's not the only idea. It's about other things. I just want to give you a glimpse of the course pages that I have for my course. I hope this opens. So this is a running course, I mean, semesters, this semester's course at Kipari Hyderabad. Popple is Principles of Programming Languages. It's a course that I teach. Uh, yeah, so here you can see another thing, right? Um, all these things, assignments, programming, and let me try to get to you some code. Okay? So let me try to show you that this, embedded in this document, is, um, yeah, let's see if that works. So I'm trying to teach something called Kali. I don't know how many of you have heard of it. It's for functional programming. Okay. And notice I've actually written some mathematics. Right. And then I have the code. Okay. okay. So just writing that two lines of code, I want to first tell a story that supports, you know, that, that kind of, the story is important. The code is supporting that story. It's like the prelude to this code. So that's the code I'm writing. And you can see all of this code. So when I'm actually teaching, it's not very unlike a book. If you open a programming book, it's not just code, right? They actually have a lot of narrative, and then they have snippets of code, they have phrases of code. So it's that description that I want. Because my students are going to read from this. It's not meant to be a book, but it's a class notes. Okay? And that's important. Of course, now the question comes, how do you run this code, right? I'll tell you about that. That's just the mechanism. But the idea is that I don't just give them a, four, a file with this code. I write a narrative. Like many of you would have read blog posts where they give code and they 
I mean, why is this is the best way to write it and so on? They're telling you a story. Otherwise, you won't have a plot. Right? So this is very important. Now let me go on quickly. We do many other things. I make slides like this, like I'm just showing you how to make exams, how to give assignments. Assignments also have a code, have equations. All of those things can be done in these things. Okay, now let me ask you this interesting question, which is how, I'm also interested in knowing how to teach programming effectively. Okay? How do I teach programming to a young kid, let's say a high school kid? What do I tell the kid? Give them the computer and say, start writing code? Most, most places do that. I mean, many of you would have learned it in school or high school or your early college. You're given the computer, uh, computer you're given the homework, and you start writing it. But imagine if you ask the student not to write the computer program, but just to write their thought process preceding the computer program. That's really important. Are they able to think through this problem? Do they have a mental model of this problem? Can they express that mental model using some other formalism, equations, diagrams, pictures, whatever it is, that is very important. Because then you're opening up that child's imagination and letting that child express himself or herself in a multitude of ways. Whereas what happens in programming is just straight jacketing. You may have all these ideas, you have, you're just kind of, you're not allowed to express them. Someone is talking to you, you're not letting you express it. And that I see is a serious problem when you approach teaching programming. Because you're supposed to tell them, look, this is the way, this is the medium for you to express ideas. But this is not the only medium. This medium works with other media. So we're not giving them the chance to combine this medium of programs with the other medium. Okay. This is a very interesting topic. I'm very interested in this. Unfortunately, I don't have much research results in this, but I'm hoping that one of these days, we will have something and I will come back and talk to you about what I found, how kids learn programming, and what we can do to make that process less simple. Of course, many of us are very smart. We figure out you know, how bad the teacher is, how bad the classroom is, there are no fans, there's no water. We, we come out, we do really well. But we kind of go past, circumvent all those problems. But lots of our friends still have problems. Lots of our friends. Okay, the last one is also has to do with expressing, but in different style. You make slides, like I'm making slides right now. I want to put a bunch of ideas together. I want to make a, I want to write a research paper. I should get LaTeX. LaTeX is a, I don't know how many of you have heard of LaTeX. It's a tool for writing, typesetting mathematics. Okay, so I do a lot of that. I want to create HTML pages, all of those things. Okay? So I can do slides in HTML. I'm now going to talk about the tools. Uh, I can do Beamer. Beamer, some of you have heard, it's uh, HTML way of doing slides. Uh, sorry, LaTeX way of doing slides. I don't know, Reveal is another thing you can try out. And this slide mode that I'm using right now. Okay, and so on and so forth. But the use cases I've mentioned to you are all my use cases. You may have your own use cases. I've found no reason to try something. I mean, I keep trying various things out, but uh, this. I've reached the sweet spot where my efficiency is very much matched to the sharpness of the tool. Let's put it that way. And of course, this is a tool that you can sharpen quite a bit, the tool that I'm using. It requires some, you know, some effort, but you can make it as sharp as you want and do whatever you want. Okay, okay so I'm done with this. Let's, um, let me give you another example since I have this example. Um, this code, suppose well, I will just dump this code on your face and ask you to understand. You don't know the programming language, you don't know anything. Okay? What's your mental model? What's going on in your mind? Can you read it? Can you see that? Yeah? How many of you have seen this syntax before? One or two of them, but it doesn't matter. Okay. Let's say let's say you have to make a guess. Is it is it understandable? What is the problem here? I just does it look familiar? What's going on here? No? Yeah, no? Factor 11, perfect. Got it, right? So we don't have, we know certain things, which means we rely on our past experience, yet we are confronted with something unfamiliar. So we type, try to stitch the past with what's in front of us. That's understanding. If you don't have prior experience, 
in something you will not be able to understand it because you're trying to deal with a new situation based on the memory that you have of your past experiences and your knowledge and your acquaintances and your familiarity and so on and so forth. Right? So, you know, imagine someone wrote this code, it came to your desk and said, okay, does this work? And then at least you try to figure out what it does. Okay? Now, just to scare you, I write that program. What is that doing? See, program comprehension, code comprehension. Partly from the idea. Sorry? Adding of numbers, okay? No, I mean, we have to guess because we don't have any identification. Imagine this is code, okay? The documentation is missing, the requirements manual is lost, the program is on vacation, and you don't, you know, they turn, you really turn off the phones with the vacation. You can't reach them. So, what do you write? So, this is a little bit of Now, if you understand this problem, please stop me. Yeah? Okay? Anyone? I'm serious. I want to talk to you. Okay, now let me show you something else. How to understand a piece of program. I need a narrative without, if I just look at the code and tell you, okay, this word means this, it's not going to help. You need something outside that code to understand the code, right? That's the important idea. You cannot look at the code, keep staring at it, try to understand it. You need a piece of knowledge, something else, information that's outside that code. And here is what is outside that code. Can you see that? What is factorial? Now it should be obvious what this code is doing. What is it doing? This is factorial, right? You write down all the zero factorial, one factorial, two factorial. You just write down these factors. Now, you write down the positive numbers. One, two, three. Now what happens? This should have done in your school in eighth grade or ninth grade. No? Series, sums, and all these amazing things that they teach you. Infinite series, and then you do s equals this, and two s equals that, and something, something. It's just like that, right? So this is one series, the factorial series. This is a positive series. If I just multiply these two series, what do I get? I almost get the factorial series. Right? What's missing? Factorial of zero is missing. So, if I say S cons, S cons means put it together, connect it. Right? S cons one means take one and take this S star. What is S star? It's almost like multiplication. This is called a stream, by the way. Stream. An infinite sequence is called a stream. So, S star is multiplication of two streams. Okay, and so I'm not just going on, right? It's a very cool idea. It's a very clever idea. But if I don't explain that idea, the code makes no sense. Once I explain this idea, the code is right there, actually. That is the code. Okay? So code is right there. So I need to be able to explain for people to understand ideas, not just through the code. That's it. That was the purpose of this. Of course, you can go on and on with this narrative. You can just write like this. We want to write. Now, this is imagine you're actually writing this as a narrative. Okay? We want to compute the factor of the function. Now, what is the factor of the function? I'm just describing all this. I'm just saying things. Okay? And that saying is slowly building a story. That's going to finally explain what those two lines of code are. Okay? So, any function f over natural is going to be thought of as an infinite list. f of n is simply the nth element of f. I mean, this is the. I need all this to understand that two lines of code. But don't get these ideas, it's very hard to That's a common idea. Okay. okay, so that finishes my first part of the talk, which is the next three parts, four parts are actually not very hard. I mean, they're not going to take very long. Okay, two, three, four, five is the rest of the talk. Okay, I have, uh, let me know when you need it. I was told that there's going to be a break in the middle. This is actually a good time to have a break. But if you think I should go on, I can happily go on. Okay, good. And how long? 10 minutes, 15 minutes? Sure. I'll be around. No, we can chat. The rest of the rest of the talk is about the technicalities, how to do things and so on. Which you can talk about. Yeah. yeah, yes, please. Yeah. Let's say someone is going to want to take the thing as a right. 
Okay, that's a good point. So there's, your, I mean, there's action and there's recording of the action. So let that person write along with you. Yeah. Actually, okay, so this is a very important point. Everybody understands what they're programming? Not true at all. In fact, So let me point this way. The only reason I write is so that I understand. My understanding develops. It's not like I suddenly have understanding and then I start writing code. No. I develop my understanding by the process of writing. Yeah. 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 Programming, sorry, programmers by coincidence. Coincidence, okay. No, no, they can say, okay. So, no, no, I don't think it's mutually exclusive. I don't think, I, I think if I have the intuition to write a program right away, and it happens to me most of the time, okay, this is a skill, this is a skill that's acquired by practice. I'm not saying this is natural, it didn't come to me naturally. I mean, my urge is to just quickly write that code. I mean, whenever I want to write two lines of code, why should I have a half page code? Okay. So the, the point is, this is not natural. Composition is not natural. Writing an essay doesn't come naturally to me. It doesn't. But I still have to do it for the sake of, you know, whatever is downstream. Yeah. That's the answer. Mm -hmm. Oh, no. this is that, that crazy argument that, you know, when computers first were introduced in India in 19, uh, there was just a computer revolution, and now people probably born in that time. I know this because I was reading the newspapers. Eh? There was massive strikes across India. You know what the strikes were about? Computers are going to make bankers redundant. They're going to make people, clerks redundant. Did that happen? No. What happened? More jobs. Okay. So this is a fear. See, operating by fear is a terrible way to do things. So why do you want to keep the knowledge in your head? What about other knowledge you acquired? Did it already, was it already born in your head? No. But it came from other things because it was explicit. So you have, you as part of this company have some knowledge which you must share with your friends. That's what makes you by the way more valuable. You know this one guy in the company who knows everything, you know, everybody goes to him for her. You want to become that person. Now you'll get a bonus, your, your salary will increase. So it's just the opposite. You need to be able to show off with your knowledge, which means you need to be able to make it explicit. Yeah. Yeah, but I'm, the narrative is a representation of that context. Okay. Narrative is English or Tamil. If you're comfortable in Tamil, you can write code in Tamil. Okay. How many of you have seen uh, program comments written not in English? Like you're writing Python programs, but you got the code from somewhere, but they're in Spanish, or they're in Portuguese, or they're in something, Romanian, whatever. But so common, right? Why is that person writing those comments in Spanish? Because that person can think better. Yes. So, so that's important. What I'm trying to say is one must encourage that, not discourage it. One must encourage a person to be poetic, a person to be artistic, a person to be generous with their ideas. That's important. Okay. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. So, very good question. The question is, can I understand but have difficulty coding? Let me tell you, most of us have that problem. Most of us. Most of the time, I have that problem. I know what this is. 
but I really have to contort my thinking a little bit more so that I can code it. Right? The coding itself comes with its own idiosyncrasies. You know, what is the while loops condition and how do I exit? I don't think in like, terms of while loops it exits like that. So then I'm asking, but then when I write a program, I have to, yes, so this difficulty is what one needs to bridge. And the challenge of programming is converting your thoughts, which are come to you in a natural way, okay? Uh, and making them natural for not you, but the computer. That's a new challenge. And that is really the challenge of programming. What I'm trying to say, I want you to get, I want to get you to the program. Not just, the program will just come out like you pull a rabbit out of a hat. No. It's a gradual process of refining and formalizing your understanding. Sorry, what was that again? BA. Okay. A test your behavior I've not heard, but yeah, maybe you could tell me what this Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, is it something that you can't talk to Yeah, these are tools that let you essentially help with the explicating of your thoughts, of your, of your ideas. Yeah. Yeah. Very old ideas. 1977. Yeah. Donald Kuhn. The ideas are similar. Yeah. The question is, how do they, how does uh, behavior driven development and test driven development? Uh, I mean, are they? Uh, my answer is they are often both going in the same direction. They are not primarily about the code. Yeah. They are supporting this idea of the code. Yeah. This is, I would think, this. I think blended program is a much more radical idea. It's more radical because it it encourages you to completely throw away your notion of writing a program to writing an app. That's right. So you have to kind of think about not the program but everything else you want. Let's say you want to add it a let's say you want to add a picture. Can you do that in your test driven development? How do I add a diagram? Yeah. Right. No, no, my question is, it's the point of view is slightly orthogonal. Yeah. So, let's say if I'm Okay. So how do you connect the test case to the requirement? How do you connect the test? I write a test case, right? So what am I testing? Where do I say what is it that I'm testing? That's why it's starting point. Okay, how do I connect to that document in English? How do I connect to that paragraph? They say this test case is checking the boundary condition that the balance should always be greater than zero. I want to say that. And that's in my requirement. Right? How do I connect these two pieces of information? The test case to the requirement. Yeah, do I have back do I have backward uh, what do you call traceability? That's the question. Right. The point is you can use whatever you can use technology. The idea is you can use whatever technology. The important idea is have you linked it. That's the important. But you can link it with the HTML links, you can have all kinds of fancy tools, uh, IDEs to do it. The point is, how are we linking that? That's the important idea. And the literal programming forces you to think about that idea. Yes, I need to link that. Then, of course,
course, you can use this up. There's a whole uh, multitude of tools that support quite similar ideas. For example, you're turning business tools into you know, whatever code, Java code, or whatever it is, the language, the tools, that are automatic natural language parsers today that take the natural language convert into requirements, convert those requirements into uh, NLP based tools. There's machine learning tools that you play with, read something, convert it, and then write down something, program synthesis tools, all these things are We will have access to many of those tools, but you should have to wait for that. Okay. Let me get some water. Sorry? I got this? I get some coffee, is it? I just have coffee. Let me know when I can start. I can start all the way. Yes. Want to go pick up something? Yeah, I'm fine. Yeah. So let me know when I can start. A few more minutes? Is it making sense? No? Sounds too familiar or sounds strange?
it's not that because I think we need to wrap up. Before I proceed, I wanted to introduce uh, Pavan. I don't see him here. He was here a few minutes ago. And Ojas. Ojas is here. Uh, Pavan, I don't see him here yet. He was here some time back. Okay. So both Pavan and Ojas uh, have helped me with the idea of the talk and also the talk itself. So I'm really thankful to them. Both of them work in my lab called Virtual Labs. And uh, both of them have used this tool, this idea tools also along with the tools. So you can also talk to them about the more ground level understanding and appreciation of what is happening. And then of course I'd like to quickly get to the discussion. But let me quickly get you to a lightning introduction to Emacs. Emacs is a text editor. Okay. And um, okay, what is Emacs? So Emacs is a tool that was built in 1984 by Richard Stallman. It's a text editor, it has its own genealogy, I won't get into that, okay? But um, there is this programming language called Lisp, and Emacs was built in Lisp, uh, with a code that was written in C, and it's now 1984, so how many years ago was that? Many, many years ago, okay, yeah. So, um, it's uh, distinguished by Two things. One is um, one of the first free software, first free pieces of software available. Okay, in fact, the whole GNU movement started pretty much with we're all aware of the GNU movement, right? Uh, Emacs and GCC were the two flagship products, if you will, of the GNU movement. Okay. The other thing that makes really Emacs amazing is it is a programmable editor, so you can actually keep adding features to it, and it's highly programmable. It's written in a highly programmable language called Lisp, and uh, people take advantage of that by writing lots of customizations so over the last several decades. It has grown quite a bit, and it does lots of lots of things. You can maybe do other things as well. Uh, let me also caution you that I'm very, in spite of using Emacs for many many years, I would still consider myself as a very uh, what's the word? Um, primitive user. I'm not a sophisticated user. I just use it and I just, when it works, I use it. If it doesn't, I don't push myself too hard. There are lots and lots. One of the things that makes you realize when you see free um, software is there are just so many smart people in the world. So, and not only that, they're not just smart, they're also very generous. The world only runs because of smart and generous people. Okay? Remember that. Everything that's running in the world, things, there's so many wrong things that are wrong in the world, but for every one thing that's wrong, there are hundred things that are right. And those hundred things are right because somebody was smart. They built something, they discovered something, they taught something, and they were generous with it. They put it up for all of us to use. Okay? And nothing illustrates this more dramatically to me than free software. Okay. It's really, I mean, I just feel so humble when I look at it. I feel so grateful that, look, I didn't have to do any of this, and just someone has done it. I don't know who it is. I'm using this tool. Okay. That's an idea that we must propagate and celebrate. Whatever happens to us, no matter how much money we make, no matter where we are, that idea that goodness is a product of genius multiplied by generosity. Okay, that's what goodness is in the world. Okay, so what I'm showing you is the result of that goodness. Okay, okay. so that's Emacs. It does lots of things for has more. So if you want to program in Python, it's got a Python mode where suddenly all the keywords of Python will look color. If you want to program in Java, it will do Java. It has some special keys for compiling. If you want to do functional programming like Haskell or something, it has some other key bindings. So it's syntax-directed editing, which is 
based on the language syntax, the keywords get highlighted. So all those you could have seen in many of your standard editors. And then you can browse the source code and you can locate uh, you know, various things and so on and so forth. Let me not block this, I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, it also has full Unicode support, so if you want to write a letter in Hindi or Telugu, you can actually start typing. Okay, so there is uh, lots of other editors. I'm, I'm sure all of you in this room have used at least one of those. You know, um, I don't know how many of you use VI or Vim. I still many users. So Vim is actually pretty old. VI is almost as old as Emacs, it but it's, it has a very dogged uh, presence after all these years. Atom and Sublime are I think more recent, or more recent vintage. Um, I don't know much about either of them. I don't use them. I used to use them before I used it's called VI most or something. Uh, before I switched to uh, Emacs. Okay, you can read about it. There's still a lot of people very possessive about the editors. For good reason, it's like a natural, it's a language, you know. People are emotional about language, so it's very natural. Okay, so I'm just gonna walk you, I don't want to waste your time trying to teach you an editor here. There's no point. You have to learn it's like how to ride a bicycle. I can't just put a bicycle and say, okay, this is a wheel and this is a spokes, and you're not going to learn how to a bicycle. So this is what it does. Okay, I use Emacs, I can open buffers, I can just open some files, you know, I can open a directory. This is my directory, ls-l, and I can just open a file, click on this, it just opens up like that. I can kill a buffer, I can, um, you know, uh, run a shell command and say, Take, it run commands, all those things I can do. So it's kind of an environment, it's a programming environment. You can just write programs, you don't want to write programs, you can write a, you know, uh, some thoughts, some text, okay. And these are some ideas. And you can just keep writing. Something like this, right? And you can say, okay, fill. And every list. No, something like this. You just keep writing. Okay? So just text. You can also write a Python program, right? Okay? You can write something like this. You notice how the colors are changing now. Uh, I can change the font size, I can as big as I want. All those things that's what you would expect from an editor that are there. So I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on the editors. Okay? This could assume if you've not learned it, you are enthused enough. Please learn it because one of the reasons I'm telling you about this editor is because this is the technology that I use in order to do little programming. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure about Vim or Atom or um, what's the other one? Yeah, whether they support uh, little programming. This I'm not sure. Okay. But um, but if they do, that's great. You don't have to switch to this tool. Just, I'm only telling you about this tool because I use it. But by no means we. To feel that this is the only thing. There's also an environment called uh, Jupyter. J U P Y T E R on it's Python based, it's web based. It's a lot of people use it. I've tried it in the past. I kind of find that uh, it doesn't connect very well with the other things that I can do in Max. So I don't use it, but it's just a matter of uh, matter where you're updating whatever you want to use. Okay? You can, about, so I can write code like this, right? Something like this. So, um, okay, so let's go back to that Emacs, okay? So you've got something, in the bottom you see a little gray line there, you know, that tells me a few things, what's the name of the file, there's a little name of the file, called emacs.org, there's line numbers, there's, I don't know, date, time, all those things, so it just gives you a little menu. You can customize everything here, you can change the color, if you don't like the color, you can just save that. Okay, and then you can't see anything at all, of course. Uh, so I change that color back. Okay, you can play around with all of this stuff. Okay, what is that? That is a little program. It's a one-line program. You, know, you can just call it. Okay. So what is interesting about Emacs is what I want to do. Uh, oops, let me hit a button. Okay, so. Give me a second, excuse me. Yeah, that was. <clears throat> Right, so one of the things that's interesting about Emacs is it's actually a programming language. So there's a full fledged programming language supporting this um, supporting this editor. And 
There are four, there are primarily four ways you can interact with Emacs. One is through the menu. Okay? Um, this is a menu. You see a menu up there? It says buffers, for example. Okay? Tells me all the buffer. Well, buffer is just a place where you dump things and it has all these buffers, you can see that. Okay? And I can also interact with keys. So one is through the mouse, others through the keys. I can simply uh, through the through the keys. Uh, sorry, through the keyboard. And I say Control X, Control B. It shows me the same thing. See, as a buffer, it opens a buffer which has this sub on the buffer. Very useful because suddenly you say, "Oh, what all these things?" Oh, let me just switch to this buffer. Okay, and then I can go back and switch to. So you can just navigate, so you can do multiple things. You're not just opening one thing at one time, but you do multiple things, and those multiple things, each of them is in a buffer, and you can kind of keep switching the thought process. And that's very important, because at any given time, I have probably like uh, 50 things open. Yeah. Of course, that also could indicate my lack of organization, or total confusion. But that's how we are, really, because they're mostly confused. There are too many things going on. Okay. Uh, that's how we are. We are not perfect human beings. Okay, so um, what I'm going to say is Emacs supports that process, that thought process, right? And that's important. There's uh, other things. There's also um, another mode. You can say list buffers. So at this point, I've got commands. So I've got graphical user interface. I've got key interface. I've also got a command interface. Look at that mini buffer. It says meta x list buffers. It does the same thing. Okay. And I can also run this code. I think this will work. So there are four, primarily four ways to interact with Emacs. There's a graphical user interface, there's a keyboard interface, there's a command interface, and there's a function call interface. Okay? So Emacs supports all of these, so you can try to one you want, and if you have one, you can generate the others. So key bindings and then two other bindings and so on. Okay? I won't get into the details. What I want to take you to now is quickly to or more. So Emacs has many modes. You know, here's a mode for Python. That's Python mode. Okay. And or is also more. And what does or do? Or is this environment ORG? It's an environment. Or stands for organizing. Okay. So try to reduce the clutter. It tells you, okay, here's a way to organize things. The organization is or. And so happens that it supports, amongst other things, different programming. There's many other things. Today I only talk about different programming. Okay. So I'm going to go to the part of my talk, which is on org mode. Okay. So again, I'm going to just my focus is not so much on the tool, although I'll show you the tool. But I want to be able to demonstrate to you that yes, this is how we do different programming. Our goal is the end of this talk to show you how to actually do different programming. Okay. It's not very hard. Okay. So. Notice how this document is open. This is a talk. That's a document I wrote. So a few minutes before coming here. And notice how the talk is organized into different sections. Okay? And to reduce the clutter, right, I can fold and unfold those sections. It's just nice, it just opens up like a little thing, right? So at this high level, I know that I've got five or six sections, and it's what you also know what they are. You don't have to know the clutter. I can open them one by one. Okay, and no, you've already seen the headline hierarchy. Right? So a single star says the top level headline, the double star says the subheading, and a triple star will mean sub subheading, and so on. You get the idea, right? So, first thing is when you want to organize things, you want an organization about hierarchy. You need some kind of hierarchy to make it to organize. So, it immediately supports hierarchy. If you want to write a doc or a word document, what did you do? You have sections and subsections, right? So, this is the key. Um, it's got all kinds of features. I won't go into this rotation and all that. Uh, I won't go into anything else. That's it. Structure editing. So you can do markup. So what's markup? You can just write. So org is basically plain text like ending. You know, you write some markup and it suddenly becomes a markup. Right? So you can, and this is very much like, how many of you have used MD? Markdown? A few of you? Okay, so basically it is not just plain text, it's slightly embellished plain text. It's plain text, but with a couple of nice neat things. You can make something bold, you can make something in italics, and so on. So, odd mode also has its own markup language for doing things. I'm sure in SMSs and all, you can do all those things. You know? 
uh, pretty soon in Emacs, you can also add smileys. I don't, I haven't seen a package for that, but I'm sure it's there. Okay. Sorry? Yeah, emojis, and, yeah, all those things. Um, I'm too old for all that stuff. So. Okay. so we remove this, you know, it's no longer code, but just put those two stars and it comes there. It's nice, right? So it just stands out. Same thing with idyllix, same thing with verbatim, same thing with strike through, if I remove that. So everything is plain text. You don't need to remember anything. You can type the entire document in BIM or even, uh, what is that, notepad. You don't need any tools. This is, org mode is a language which just uses plain symbols. Okay, it just so happens that even when you type that in Emacs, okay, I, mean, let, I can do one little change. I can make this entire document. I can, the same file, the same document, I want to change the mode. Okay, that's going to look like this. This is a text file. This is the real file. Okay, what Emacs does is interprets this file. It can read and understand that mode. That's why it can know that the keywords should be purple and the variables should be blue and so on and so forth. Similarly, it knows how to display that. Okay, but if I don't, if I want the default display, which is plain text, okay, you just look at this, you just type this plain text. What Emacs gives you is you can say meta x or more and make it like So just it's a different way of looking, it's a different view of the system. Right? That's all it is. So, but when you're writing, you can just assume it's plain text. You don't want to write in Emacs or write in Bing, you can just write it. The idea is not that oh Emacs will do this fancy thing, no. The idea is that you can structure your document in a certain way. And it's a language that lets you structure. Okay. So Structure anything is what I just talked about. And marker. Okay. Okay, you can also do links. You can do URLs. Right? So let's do right? Did I spell it right? Okay. So I just created a URL. No problem. And I can just open it. So it's very easy. You don't have to go to a browser, do this, do that. Okay. It's just simple keystrokes. You won't even notice the keystrokes that I do it so fast. It takes me a fifth of a second or a tenth of a second to type a key. It takes me about half a second to one second to move the mouse. Right? So it's about an order of magnitude faster when I work with a keyboard. Okay? So you can do URLs. I mean you've already done Wikipedia, you've seen how Wikipedia works. You can write the URL, you can say thought works. Let me know if this is right. No? Okay, there you go. So I just give a name to that URL. Okay, so you can create hyperlinks. So the whole point is you can create highly, uh, a web of highly hyperlink properties. You can also create local links. Right? So I can create a link to the index file that I had just now. So notice I write the file like that. Double square brackets and close it. And suddenly it becomes a link. And when I have a link, I can click on it. Okay. I can just say open this sentence. It just happens to be a local link and Emacs will open it. So it can not only have hyperlinks, you can also link within the document. Uh, sorry, you can link within the file system. You can also create links within the document. This is very useful. So let's try this out. So uh, let's say we create a link called uh, Sunday. Fine. Okay, and anytime I do funny, uh, it should be. What is this? Yeah, notice this here link on its own. Okay, so that's called a radio. It's just to say, okay, this thing anywhere this word occurs, I should go back to that. So I click on this, it goes back. So within the document, you can just say, this is important. Imagine you're writing a document and somewhere you have to find a term. So every time you see the term, you want to go back to the glossary, to the definition, right? Just so that it's clean. So you're just creating a web of understanding. That's how the understanding is always a web, it's not linear. It's always everything connected to each other. That's understanding. So this supports an idea of understanding. Okay. So you can go on like this. Uh, one nice thing in in um, uh, 
Notice I'm building my slides as I talk. Okay. Uh, one of the things that you can do is do tables. It's a little hard to draw tables in most editors I've seen. Um, you can do a lot here. You have to build it. So you can just do this: one keystroke, second, third. I got, I got a table. Two keystrokes. Right. And I can do all kinds of things here. Right. Name. Right. Country. Okay. Head. Right? And the, uh, it's more the, I mean, you can write things like this, right? right. Okay. Yeah. Whatever it is, you can just keep building things. You can also write uh, other things, whatever you want. You can actually turn this into a spreadsheet. Okay. Uh, something like that. Okay. So, country population. Something like that. Something like this, right? And then you can say US and then say the population is what kind of city. Right? And you can just turn this into a let's see this works. Yeah, you can just add the population. You can do all this. So it just gives you a nice so imagine you had to actually write a program about something, but the best way to express that idea is through a table. It happens so many times, right? For this case, there should be the answer. For this case, there should be the answer. The best way to do that is not through code. I mean, you can write the code ultimately, but you've got to be nice to write a table. It's become so obvious that this is what's going on. So that support is important for me. Okay? That's what I'm talking about. So I just talked about spreadsheets. You can also do images. I'll show you in just a moment how to do images. You can just stick an image right there. Okay? Uh, and the next thing when you do all of this stuff, you want to, you don't want to look at this file because you're the person, you want to automatically publish this file, right? You want to have this on some web page somewhere. Right? So you want this to turn into HTML. Okay? So you can just say some keystrokes, some magic, and it becomes a web page. Correct? And uh, let me make it slightly more beautiful. Um, yeah, I can I can play around with it. I can also do this. Uh, give me just a second. So I can stick a line here. This does something, gives me a theme, right? And voila, it turns into something like beautiful. Okay? Okay? You can also turn it into people like us who use LaTeX a lot, like to write notes in. So turn it into LaTeX, which is my name there, it's my body name. Okay, that's a document. So you can write your source code and you can actually give it to your box. Here's here's the source code, it's a book, it's a chapter. Here, read it. At that point, you're not reading source code, you're just reading, you know, you're reading a narrative, it should be like a story. Okay? Okay. You can do many other things, you can also write, um, uh, what is it, uh, ODP? Is that ODP? Open, uh, open office, you can also turn into open office. I don't use it very often. Most of the time I use HTML or LaTeX. So it works and then become PDFs. Um, okay, so I'm done with that. Uh, uh, slides I already showed you. Um, with slides I've uh, shown you that I can actually turn this into slides in just a moment. I can say all the slide mode and You can kind of keep doing this. So notice everything is interaction in the. I mean, as you've seen it, right? I push this. I've done this six times. I can just. Uh, that's just for effect. You can also do Beamer. I have a list of every Beamer. Where is that? Yeah, the Max I have there. Sorry, I have to say that. Um, never mind. So I'll now switch to the last part, which is actually writing code in the program. I mean, how do you 
much we do little for them. So these are the Emacs and Alcon are the tools that we use. So now let's quickly switch to the penultimate part of this talk, or actually the last part of this talk after that we we'll open up the discussion. So it's called doing NP, which is doing the Here's my talk. Okay. So the main idea is you can write code, code what are called code blocks. Imagine that you've got this narrative and you're writing a piece of code. Okay. So here's my piece of code. Sorry, all of this is documented online. You can just go to the org mode manual. There's org mode manual, it's a section of it. You can just kind of you can just say org mode or org, you can put it here. Okay. Okay. So let's go to uh, so let's go to this example code block. It looks very complicated, but basically all it's saying is printing 3 plus 4, and what is that's Python code, it's highlighted with Python and so on and so forth. Okay, and I can run this code. I can actually remove this line here, and I run it, it prints this out. So it actually executes that code right there. So as you're writing the code, you also want to execute the code. Okay? That's the point. Okay. So of course, you have to say something, some incantation, big at the source programming language names, some flags, and you can figure out all that. But the idea is you can embed the code in a larger document. This is not a .py file. Okay. And not only can I not just put, uh, not only can I put a Python file in there, Python piece of code, I can also put shell in put all of them in the same document. Now what if I'm a DevOps guy, you know, or a person, DevOps person, I'll be having shell, I'll be having Python, I'll be having some natting rules, I don't know what all are, have some YAML code, all of those will be in one big file, right? One big narrative. So I can put in all these pieces. It's hard to do that if it's just a Python uh, source file. So the source file is not linked to any programming language. It's a big advantage. Okay. So you can do other things. So this is a format for writing a code block. Okay, source like that. The begin example is just like to show that it's like verbatim, it is right. This shows up, uh, and um, these are all details. You can skip all this. I want to just go to the very last one. Um, okay, so one of the things that's important here is um, once I write the code, I actually want to suppose run the code. I can't run it from the org. I can't give the org file to the Python interpreter. Right? So I need the Python interpreters means Python. So I want to be able to take all the code that is there and pull it out into the Python code goes in the Python file, the shell code goes in the shell, uh, you know, dot, uh, something dot sh and so on and so forth. I want to be able to, in the parlance of our mode, I want to be able to tangle things out. In other words, I want to untangle them. So it's called tangle for whatever reason. So I want to sit here, get all the code that is in my document and pull them out into respective files. So that's just one keystroke away. It's called export, uh, sorry, it's called tangling. And I just at the very bottom, you can't read it, says tangled two code blocks from doing lp.org. So it actually pulled out those pieces. What are those pieces? And where are they mentioned? Somewhere here, there's a file called tdd.py. Okay, so let's put something in this file called tdd.py, which is some code. Okay, so I'm writing the code in the org file, but I can always pull the code out. Okay, so every time I Make changes in, I can pull the box, right? Of course, when I debug, I debug that and make sure I make changes here, and that's kind of the cycle. Okay. Okay, now let me give you an example of something else that's very important that happens in programming. That chain of thought, a train of thought, and this the structure of the program don't always have to match. Okay? A good example of that is what? Test driven development. Okay. What is test driven development? The development of the code is driven by the test. So what do you do first? Right, the test cases first. Now, of course, how can you run the test case without the code? So this is an example where you want to write the test case first, but you can't run it. So in your actual file, imagine you're actually writing this Python file. Okay, it's supposed to have the test cases and the code. It's going to have the code before. I or you can write a function, you can do all those things, but just imagine the sequence in which you think about something need not correspond to the sequence in which it appears in the code. What looks all right? Maybe you just want to think about this. Maybe you want to think top down. But maybe your program is got to be bottom up. 
all those problems are there, right? So how do you supplement that? So later programming turns out to be very useful here. Okay? And you can write pieces of code and then assemble them for output to ship them out any time you want, in any order you want. So notice up there I've written two pieces of code, very tiny pieces of code. One's called one. <laughs> here, it's a test. Okay. So this is the idea. Order of the narrative need not match the order of code. Example T T D D. Just test driven development. And there is a way to do that. So you write this code here. Notice it says f of 3 is 4. It's asserting that, but I've not defined it. Okay, but I want to first assert it because based on this assertion, I want to write the code. You could have a very complex assertion, right? Okay. So that's one, that's one fragment of the code. And right there below that is the implementation of f, which is the other fragment. You see that? Okay. Now I want to put them together, but when I put them together, I want to put the definition first, which is the second piece of code, and then the test case. Okay? So if I look at my file, which is, what's the name of the file? Tangle into, okay? if I look at that file, where is it? Okay. So notice the definition comes first and then the test case. Although my narrative, the test case has proceeded, which is the way you want it, right? You want to think in terms of the narrative. And the narrative is saying, hey, this should be the answer. I don't know what the function, what this F is going to be like, but this one should. So it matches your, you know, the train of your mind. That's the point. Okay. Okay. Give me one last example and then I'm going to stop. The last example is a little complicated, so I might need Ojas's help. I don't normally do this, but uh, it's part, I'm, I'm doing this just to show you that it's possible. It's pretty, it's pretty nifty. What it does is there is a piece of code right here. It's doing three things. You write a piece of code. The piece of code generates a table, and that table turns into a plot. And you want to do all of them together. Remember, I was talking about diagrams and things like that. You want to have all of this together. Right? So, in my narrative, I have a piece of code. That code will generate a table. That table will be plotted into a plot, into a picture. So, here's this piece of code. Okay, that's this code block. It's a big in source means it's a code block. And you write some uh, Python code. It's basically what is it doing? It's uh, taking some data and it's generating uh, it's generating a table, right? Yeah. So it's generating this thing. Data is basically giving you a table with three columns. So I can run this piece of code and notice this thing. When I run this piece of code, I just can just run this piece of code by just pressing two buttons. Control C, Control C, see that twice. Okay. Notice it again. Do you see what's going on? Any idea what's going on? It's running. The code is running. <laughs> it's generating the table every time. Yeah? It's just generating random values every time. So they, they keep changing. That's the idea, right? So from this code, when I run this code, I can just be sitting inside our code and run Python, which is really cool, I think. I can just be sitting here and the Python just runs from somewhere. Of okay, course, some configuration, all that is needed, but just, you know, bear with me. There's a lot of configuration that's needed, which I've skipped. But it can be done. It's not very hard. Um, okay, so now that I have this table, uh, now that I have this table, I'm interested in plotting it. So I can say plot, just like source. I can say plot, and what I'm what I'm saying here, here's the title of this plot, the x1. Here is the independent variable, and what's the independent variable? The first column. And there are two dependent variables. What are the dependent variables? It's a list of two table, uh, two columns, column number two and column number three. And uh, 2D is a type. It's a 2D plot. It's not a 3D plot. And then it says histograms, so you're actually going to see histograms, and the range goes from 0 to something. Okay? And it goes into this file called ex1.png. So now I want to generate from this table, which itself got generated from the Python code, I want to generate a plot. A plot will become a PNG file, and then I should be able to look at that. So let's see how that works. Uh, or uh, what is it? Plot. Right? And it uses new plot. New plot is a library for plotting. Okay. So okay, it runs, it says done. And what does it finish doing? It's created a file called ex1.png. So I can look at that file. There's a link here. Okay, I can create that link. I've already created that link, but nothing was in there. Okay. So this is the link. You can see it's just linked to ex1.png. If I open that, you can see a plot. Okay. Actually, I can do something even more cool. I can say, all inline, sorry, 
on this plane in line with each other. Yeah, Emacs commands are pretty long, but they help you. I mean, you almost have to say a sentence, please open the door. You know? and so, can't just bark at it and say, open. There's no show that. Gotta be polite to it. Okay? And then it does that. Pretty thing. In the same document, you can see the plot, you can see the code, you can see the table, everything. Okay, now once you're done with all of this, you also want to present it to your boss, and you can't just present this all in five, right? It looks pretty messy. I mean, what if your boss is not using Emacs? You don't file it. Okay. So, what you want to do is generate a nice HTML page like that, and keep going. Now, this is a nice header here. You can do all of this stuff. You can get a plotting. You see the code there. You see the table. And you see the plot. Okay, that's your story. That's the way you want to go to your boss and impress him or her. And, you know, this is what I did. This is what I thought about. Then I got these requirements. Then I got that code. And guess what? From that code, I got this table. And then here's this plot. You know? And then, oh, you guys are going, yes, yes, okay. Yeah, they know what they're doing. Good. Okay, okay I'll stop here. Questions? All of them are there in the directory. All the files that you're talking about, all the associated files are here. So that's the org file doing lp.org. Okay? Then uh, there's a whole bunch of files. There's the HTML file, or uh, sorry, doing lp.html, that's the HTML file. And there was another file, right? The ex1.pd, that's actually right. They're all the same thing. You can move them, put them, yeah, you can do all that, massage them, put them in different places, all that's possible. But yeah, you have all of these things. All the goodies are there in one place. Okay, what is complex? Define complexity. Is it lines of code or is it like the program I showed you is only two lines, one line long? What is complexity? Complexity is in our understanding. I mean, you want to write a million, if you think, let's, let's assume for the moment that million lines is complex. Okay, the question is, million lines of what? Million lines of code, right? For every one line of code, the code is complex precisely because you don't have anything supporting it. You don't have a narrative to that code. That's why it's complex. Otherwise, you read one piece, it's more than a thousand pages, but you won't find that complex to you. You've got a complex plot and you've got a complex story, but you'll you know, enjoy reading it. But the difficulty is that you're looking at code. It's million lines of code. A thousand pages, even ten pages of code. Yeah, you don't think of code. You don't think of code. Don't think of code. Code will be there. Just do you think about which figure should be in which file? Do you ever worry about which table should be in which file? No. So why are you worried about which code will be in which file? Think about how you're going to structure your narrative. Oh, I should have a nice picture here. I should have this video of this person talking here. Think of the structure. Oh, I should make this thing come out like this. I mean, that's the creativity we're looking for because you want to convey an idea in the most powerful way. That's the All that is, whatever you said is entirely possible, by the way. You can put links, you can make things, you can do all that. Just with this, uh, I, I barely scratch the surface, by the way, of this uh, literate programming actual technology. You can do all kinds of fun. You can feed the output of one piece of code into the input of another one and make them print something somewhere else and capture all this. They can do, but that's not the idea. I mean, you can play around with it for a couple of hours and you can figure out all that. But don't think in terms of files, don't think in terms of lines of code. It's a wrong way to think about programs. That's the message I want to leave all of you with. Not that. Have the code, but have the narrative. Okay, anything else? Any other questions? Okay, now, last five minutes. Okay, yeah, I know. Matter of time. Right? It's, going, it's supposed to finish by 8.30, right? Who else was what I was told? No? Eight. Yes. Okay, let's say five minutes. Five minutes. Eight thirty. Yes. What time is it now? Eight fifteen. Yeah. Okay. Good. So three minutes. Good.
I have some questions for all of you. Actually, if you could write it down, that'd be great, but you don't have to write it down. Maybe you can just write down once. So, my question is what do you do when you write a program? First question that I ask. Second, what do you do when you read a program? How do you read a program? How do you write a program? What kind of difficulties do you have? Or is it just you just breeze through it? No. Just, oh, you know, I can just write it. Just ask me anytime I can write it. I mean, or are there genuine problems? This is an answer that I'm craving to find out. I really want to know. I'll be happy to share. I mean, I've kind of already told you my own experience. I find writing code hard, reading code harder, <laughs> okay? And most of the time, I get the code wrong. I get it wrong, 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 wrong. Goes on about 10 times before something starts showing up. You know, otherwise, the file will be missing or some error will come, some null pointer. It happens like before 20 times before I get that one little answer I'm looking for. It takes me hours, days, weeks, months to write a piece of code. So I'm pretty bad at writing code. How do I? Apparently, teach people how to write code. So, but what I'm trying to tell you is, I'm not making an excuse. I'm just saying, saying the process of writing through me is writing prose. And what has helped me in getting and becoming a better programmer is that I can now explain what I want to write. And in the process, I'm teaching myself what I want to do. I'm talking to myself when I'm writing. I'm talking to myself, hey, this is what I want to do. This is how I think I'm going to do it. Let me test this out. I'm saying, I'm just going to speak more about that. That's important. So, if you want, by the way, little programming has no problem if you want to attach a video file. You're actually talking, hey, I want to write this program and I think you should do this and you know, this is what I did. And then I first make this assumption and then let me try this out. You can go on like that and put a narrative right there. Okay? So, that's very important that you put something in it. So, please tell me what are the, I want you to keep talking. I want the answers to you. What? Just randomly pick your hand up, put your hand up, and tell me what? How do you do it? What do you, what, what do you do? And what is the difficulty that you genuinely face when you write code? Or is it always such a breeze that you can just write the code? Right. Okay. Okay, so you need to understand that logic. So where do you find that understanding? No, it's correct. It's fine. 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 Okay, so you want to understand the logic, but where do you get the logic from? Who gives it to you? Okay, so is the problem statement always so nicely chiseled and perfect that you get it? Would anyone in the industry ask you to write Fibonacci, for example? No. What would they ask? I mean, they wouldn't ask you, they wouldn't give you a problem statement. I mean, I've never come across someone who says, okay, here's a problem statement. Find x, you know, where x is, you know, solve, you know, solve this equation, is never like that. So, that's part of the difficulty. Sorry? Right, okay, build a multi line. I don't know what it is. Okay, sure, yeah, please. Okay, so they start with use cases, that's what. So, at least it tells you, okay, this is what this person should be able to do, they go to the bank. So how do you represent the use cases? What would you do? What do you have to do when you write the use cases? You draw diagrams. Where do you draw them? How does it connect to the code? Is my question. You wrote all that, but that was requirements or design. How does it connect to the code? How does that actually connect? Right. I want to say when I'm writing this test case, requirement 3.2.5 is what I'm testing. This test case, if I be labeled 3. test 3.2.5, so I know that if this fails, that requirement is going to be wrong. Right. So I want that kind of thinking. The technology is there to hyperlink it, do this, do that, copy paste, everything from copy paste, hyperlink is there. But that's what I'm talking about. Okay? So, how many of us are able to connect 
and link our test cases with the requirements of the design. So typically you connect the design with the requirements and you connect the test cases with the design. So if I say, well, I chose this array, so design says that I chose this array from one to million, and you know now all the operations is array. Now I'm going to try a test case. What happens if I try to access the minus first element of this array? Something like that, right? So how do connect with that? Okay. Anything else? Then we wrap up a few minutes. Yes, please. Uh, Could you? Sorry, what is? You want to draw a picture and put it? Certainly it's possible here. You can take a uh, stylus, draw a picture, save it as a PNG file, and put it right there in the network. I can just show you. Remember, I showed you the network diagram? That is a picture. Okay, I can also pull out some other picture. Um, less. So let me see if it's like, Give me just a second, okay? Uh, peach, purple, offerings, and I mean, maximum pages. Source graphics. There's that uh, JavaScript thing that I did with this. Yeah. Let's try to see if it happens. Yeah, I think this has a picture. Yeah, this is a notes on JavaScript. I was teaching this class in this semester. So I think it has a diagram, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Yeah, I also want to think in terms of diagram. I'm just getting tired of writing this code and I don't understand what it does. So I needed this diagram to represent my current understanding of the system. And the diagram, it turns out, is so essential for my understanding. Right? So I say, well, here's the diagram, sorry. So the diagrams, yeah, so, the, so notice that this diagram is part of that narrative that also has code and prose and so on. Okay, anything else? What is the difficulty you have when you read code? When you read code, what happens? So it's called, always going to be correct with respect to something, right? So correct with respect to what and then what is missing? So you've got to take some guesses. So what do you do when you take that guess? When you write it down? Now you made now you made a guess about what that intent of that other programmer was, but where do you document that? So you also your intent is also now invisible to the next person down the line, right? So we're simply perpetuating this uh, uh, knowledge that is hidden. You'll never be able to get it. It's just not reachable. You can't reach it. I mean, is that, does that actually happen? Is it, is it a real situation? I mean, how real is it? Fairly common. So, what do you do to mitigate that problem? But unit test is also code, right? So he's just writing more code. <laughs> to explain code, you're writing more code. Sorry? Okay, so you put some comments and you say, okay, well, you know, this test code. But uh, yeah, but you see that you're, you're kind of limited in your medium there. The comment has a particular syntax. Suppose I want to put a diagram there, I can't put that in the program. So, when you, so your source files are all what? The source files are all, let's say, writing Python program. Uh, you have only the Python program to play with, right? I mean, whatever you want to say about that program has got to be in the top by file. No or yes? How many of you think it's yes and how many think it's not? Yes? I mean, I'm asking a practical question. How you practice code? You've got, a, you've got a Python, you're writing some Python programs and you want to say something about the program. So what is the space? What's the medium? What's the canvas you have to say? On which you can say things. Okay, so comments. Okay, so comments is within that uh, same source file. 
Uh, okay, so you write a markdown document, and how do you connect that markdown document to this? Okay, good. So that's a very good answer because that's what I was looking for. You, what GitHub can do is actually all of this stuff sits in GitHub, GitLab, or somewhere, and GitLab has a way of interpreting all. It's pretty decent. So it just becomes a narrative. You see the code right there. In fact, that we use that all the time. Okay, so you can just write it in GitHub, and GitHub will list it. And of course, then you can tangle that. So in what normally you do is you write your something, you know, program.py, and then it also have a program.md. And then somebody wants to read program.py, has got a, and find out why this line is there, has got to open program.md, and then read that. It's kind of clumsy. It destroys an actual flow. But it is kind of weaved out, separated out. The two. They should be like this, you know. Woven together, the narrative and the code, and then like that. Okay. Any other comments? Any any anything else you want to share? It's interesting. Finding where the narrative will start. Suppose you work with a new code base, right. and uh, the functions that are arranged optimally in subject types in different objects, and right. right. And you are just trying to find the thread, just find the thread, and then over there. Yeah, so that's hard because if someone dumps a million lines of code, it's happened to me also. And you're just fresh to the company, that's when it hits you pretty bad. So, just your building and understanding of the system okay, should be the narrative. This is how I'm trying to understand it. So, many people are senior developers and say, Look, this is my current understanding. So, but at least you can express that understanding. Of course, you have hyperlinks to all the functions and the codes and the files. And so, the, you've already built a web of understanding. Yeah. Yeah, we have done that internally. I've not taken open source projects and done that. It's entirely possible. It's entirely possible. Uh, but we have done that for. Uh, uh, we've had our own legacy projects for which we have done. I've done that for my own notes. So yeah. Yeah. The file structure would okay. So the file structure would be just a bunch of odd files. No, no, not that one. Uh, but they would have some sort of file structure. Yeah. Right. Versus you writing one file. Right. And then you can navigate from yeah. that. Yeah, exactly. That's it. Yeah. So we tried that and it, it comes out pretty nice actually. Uh, of course you still have you can still have subdirectories and org uh, you know which which kind of tell you. You, you still want certain structures. Yeah. You want all your test cases here, you want all your design documents here. But at some level they all exist in this space and they're all linkable, so they're kind of on this you know uniform space. Yeah, yeah, you can do packages. Yeah, it's a little. Uh, yeah, Python has that. Yeah, you can do that. I've done that. I've actually with Python, I've done that. A little bit of a pain, but yeah, I've I've had Python. Uh, uh, done, uh, yeah. Okay. Anything else? It's getting late. People are getting sleepy. At home. Have dinner. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I am given to understand that there is an org mode for Vim. I've not tried it out. Yeah. Uh, but you can also go to Emacs, it has a Vim mode. You can start Emacs and so Meta has Vim mode. Yeah. No, there is that. So you, you're right. So you, by the way, you can use many other tools. There are other, uh, what do you call, uh, different programming tools. Emacs is, doesn't have a monopoly. Yeah, yeah. Just like, okay, so that's handy. Yeah, yeah. So they can do that. And yeah, that the whole configuration that Netflix was talking about, you don't need to, because they already have configured. Yeah, yeah. So here you've got to do some, I mean, I wouldn't say very heavy lifting, but yeah, some decent amount of hacking to get this, you know. But it works. I mean, I can. So now, I guess the question is to the manager. I had a very interesting question in the break. I'm sorry, you said I don't know your name. Chaitanya. Chaitanya, yeah. So the question from Mr. Chaitanya was, you seem so obvious, how come it wasn't done before? 
by the way, this technology, this idea is at least almost five decades old. Yeah, 1972 or something like that. 74. Right? 70s, mid 70s. Yeah. There was a, there was a uh, book, uh, basically, this inventor of tech, PEX, Donald Moon. He wrote the program in a literate style. The program is a Pascal program. Pascal is a programming language, some of you know. It was the first language I learned. Okay. And tech was built in that. And he wrote a book. The book was source code, this, a literate version of this. And uh, so that's yeah, quite simple fact. Right? So I think uh, two, I, I can attribute two reasons. I mean, Tooth is, of course, way, way ahead of his time. He built his own tools. <laughs> and uh, the technology hadn't quite caught up. Um, this tool itself was built by another scientist. The Ormod was built by an astronomer. He's an astronomy in Denmark. Or something like that. Okay. So scientists uh, still build their own tools. They, they, they have the program. So, uh, what I'm trying to say is that technology uh, requires time, but also I think education. Uh, that's where I would hold uh, what we teach in schools and colleges becomes so important because we set people on a path and they kind of can't think of other ideas. That's a shame that uh, we don't get them to explore as much. Yeah. So, I, I, I mean, when I teach programming, this is my uh, first class is or no. Before I even teach a program in language, I teach a language. So, so well, this is the way you want to think about programs. So this is the very first class and the lab is this. Actually no, sorry, the first one is Git. Nowadays people learn Git, so I don't have a, have a class in that. But the second class is this. Then you get into programming in Python. So that's good, much later. Okay, thank you very much for hosting me this evening. It's a real pleasure talking to all of you. Really enjoyed it. Thank you. Uh, you can reach me. I am a. I